financial crisis of 2008 sent the U.S. economy reeling and caused many people to go looking for new models for making a living. One many turn to is the worker cooperative, where workers own a share of the company and have a chance to run a business that also serves their community. But co-ops aren't easy, and they aren't for everybody. Own the change, building economic democracy one worker co-op at a time, takes a look at what it takes to get a worker cooperative off the ground. If you want to know more, there are materials on our website that you can use to try it yourself. Worker cooperatives can be an effective strategy uh, to challenge uh, the few companies that dominate the world economy. We really stopped seeing ourselves as an alternative, that we saw ourselves as the viable mainstream option for all the things, all the problems that everyone had been complaining about um, through economic troubles throughout the decades. Creating worker-owned businesses and creating them in a network and at a point that can scale, I think can be done anywhere, in any community. I mean, it's really believing that my labor and what I'm doing, it's really part of me and who I am. It's a win when we all succeed and we make profit and we're on time and on budget and we all lose when we take a loss, when we, when we have a learning curve or a, a project that unforeseen things pop up. It becomes like a collective knowledge. A lot of these things could be solved through what we had experienced as worker owners um, and as people who, who were able to, to apply that model to all these different sectors in cooperatives. Worker cooperatives are part of the international cooperative movement. Um, cooperatives are always based around their democratically run enterprises, so businesses that meet members' needs. In the case of a worker cooperative, those members are actually the people who work there. Um, and so they, those members democratically control the workplace, not necessarily the day-to-day -day operations or even the week-to-week -week operations, but they at the very least elect a board of directors um, and have a voice in big decisions in the co-op and also, where is this co-op really going? How does it treat its workers? What are, we, what are our main business operations? All those big decisions workers have a voice in. And also, what's the management structure? Uh, and so what management structure do we want that best sort of fulfills the business needs and our sort of personal workforce and leadership development needs? We own the business jointly. Um, and we um, operate in a democratic way. When we first started off, we did not think about forming it as a worker-owned cooperative. Um, then it came about, we started thinking that we wanted something different. We wanted something where we would feel empowered. We wanted something where we were in control of how we structured things. And we wanted something that was beneficial. We are all organizers in our own right. Um, and we did not want to succumb to the pressures of private businesses and it being about money and not taking care of ourselves. We own it and we get to make the decisions for ourselves. We have the ownership over our space so we are constantly like tweaking it and creating it and building it. We, we pay ourselves rather modestly especially since we're reinvesting a lot into the company but you know I feel like we all feel really empowered. We're we made it out of the typical system and it's you can never go back once you've done that. We share out um, part of the surplus, the financial surplus that is made at the end of the year in good years. So each worker gets a slice of that pie. Um, but we also get the, uh, the, get the chance to cross train. So if I'm a driver, I can be trained to be a dispatcher or a mechanic. I mean, we've had a number of people gain skills in other jobs. Um, to move around the cooperative. There are a lot of difficulties in launching any business, including cooperative businesses, and I think that people sometimes can get so excited about a co-op that they forget uh, all of the unpaid time and labor-intensive thought and expertise that goes into launching any viable, successful business. Uh, so we faced that with our eyes wide open, and we began as independent contractors for Aorta. And we said, well, how can we take the work that we're already doing independently and make it work better by, by pooling our resources and coming together uh, and eventually forming a cooperative. You can't start up a worker-owned cooperative with the idea that you're going to make money right now. You have to start up a worker-owned cooperative with a vision of 10, 15 years from now what you want to leave. 
We got our EIN number um, shortly after we started. Um, and then we said, okay, this is official and we, we're gonna do this. It took basically almost a year between the conception of the idea to when we launched. Circle of Life started about six years ago, founded by Joanne McNerthy in Bellingham, Washington. She was taking care of her father at home and needed to hire caregivers to come into the home. And um, what she noticed was that in their other jobs, the caregivers were not making very much money and they had no say in their um, working conditions. And so she thought, a, a worker co-op would be just the perfect model for this group of people. And what she did was put out a public notice and ask caregivers around the county, hey, are you interested in starting a business? Do you want to own your own business? Do you want to work in caregiving under a different model? And people responded. And this group of people met for about a year and a half and figured out how to start their co-op and um, got their business license, wrote up their bylaws, got licensed by the state of Washington, and opened their business. One of the biggest challenges that a lot of cooperatives face is they haven't really spent enough time thinking through the, their business model, their business strategy. It's really understanding the revenue structure. How is it that you're going to make money? It's understanding the customers, what kind of staffing is, ne is necessary, what kind of businesses or what kind of uh, managerial talent do they need to have in order to make the business work? What is the problem or the need that you need to solve for someone? Because you need to create value for someone else in this business. And if it doesn't, then the business doesn't exist. It doesn't, it's not gonna survive in the long run. So are you a viable, successful business that can create value over the long term and increase the value that you're creating as you grow? All of our lives we had been told that we was only this and we was only that. And New Era Cooperative allowed us to see that we was much more than that. Actually, what really surprised all of us, because we surprised ourselves, uh, at Republic, we only thought that we only knew how to make windows, you know, because this is what we were told, is that we were window makers. When we moved into our own plant, we found out that we was electricians. We found out that we was plumbers. You know, we found out that we were people of industry. I found out I was a salesman. I would say the biggest factor for success for a co-op during the start-off phase, it is rooted in this, um, the relationships of the founders and the understanding and agreement they have with each other and their level of um, education and training on number one how to run the business you know so there's just purely the business thing that any business needs to be successful but number two the, the democratic uh, processes and structures um, that they're going to need moving forward to make the co-op be uh, a successful cooperative democratic business and to get really clear on what each founder is willing to contribute what each founder expects to get out of it. Um, having those really open, honest uh, discussions amongst that group is really, really important. When we first started working together as a group, we weren't a co-op. We were just a group of friends working to get a permit. But as we worked together, we realized each one of us had a skill or a talent that balanced the whole group. No one of us individually could have gotten a permit. A lot of organizations toying with the idea or maybe getting into co-op development in low-income communities, have experience in community organizing, social work, things like that that are, are very valuable complements for cooperative businesses. They, they're an important piece of the puzzle, but they don't necessarily have experience developing businesses. So key to effective co-op development is developing great businesses and developing people and the combination of effective human and business development. And most co-op developers emphasize one or the other. So I think building capacity to do both is a key need for the sector. There's too many times where cooperatives have started up um, and just through and just been like, all right, we can do this. And then people realize that their whole lives they haven't been practicing democracy. Democracy isn't something that you do once every four years. Democracy is something you have to do every day in order to be good at it and to actually run a business with it. So the, the important thing is, you know, 
um, learning how to be in meetings. So meeting before uh, you start your cooperative, meeting about uh, you know what your decision making process is going to be like the the old phrase deciding how to decide um, actually you know dis discussing what your vision is what your bylaws are going to be um, people have to learn how to be note takers have to learn how to facilitate meetings there's too many times that like co-op groups fall apart because people just don't know how to talk to each other don't know how to have democratic conversations um, and that's a process it's not something that's going to happen overnight and maybe some people have some of those skills already from other experiences but too many times in our uh, society that's just not something that we learn. Being a co-owner of a small business um, is a really intimate thing and so we first of all are structured, our organizational structure is that we're all equal, we function uh, on a consensus basis, we share tasks and responsibilities uh, to, the, to, the, to the greatest extent that makes sense. We also believe in specialization and support one another. So consensus would be checking in uh, when something is proposed, making sure that every single person is okay with going forward with that decision. Somebody can stand aside if they feel a little tentative about it, or they can say, uh, let's try this for a little while and then revisit it later. What we learned was, or I learned from our, one of our coaches was, Vertical implementation in the field, horizontal decision making at the board level. So what does that mean? We're not all equal. Oh no, co-ops don't want to hear that. No, we're not all equal. Some people have more skill and knowledge than others. We all have an equal vote. We all have an equal say, but we don't all have equal skills and knowledge. So what that means is when you're working on a board level, everyone sits on an equal level around a circle or however and we speak and vote and treat each other as equals. But when we get into the field, it could change a lot because one person has a whole lot of knowledge and has to impart that to a lot of other people. And you don't necessarily want everyone in the decision-making process in the field. You want their inclusion and they want them to look out for ways to uh, make things easier or quicker or more profitable, but you don't want a conversation at every fork in the road. You want to have a leader who takes you through the process in the field, meaning in, on the construction site. Um, but when you come into the office, it's kind of like you leave that away, you leave that, you hang that, those hats up and you all wear the same hat in the, in the office. To actually, actually get the capital to start a cooperative is, it's a difficult process. You can try to scrape to get a little bits you have, what I call the cracks in the sidewalk strategy. You can go to traditional bank and face the incredible amount of prejudice you'll get there, but not just prejudice, the desire of the financial industry to get the spoils of your work. That's the point of the, of the capital industry. So to get at the terms you need, if you're actually going to own your own company and, and, own, the, and own the surplus of your work is difficult. Um, there, is, there are options like the working world, there are some other loan funds for worker cooperatives in the United States. Uh, there's the Cooperative Fund of New England, North Country Development Fund. But right now, the other options, people have used crowdsourcing. Again, that's actually another form of getting people to have capital. I mean, it's only 50 bucks, but getting them to have that be for the benefit of others, have that be for the, so the people can use capital to their own ends. There were a couple issues that Union Cab faced uh, when starting that had they gone a different way would have resulted in the failure of the enterprise. Um, the first one was just raising enough capital um, and the original founders really uh, dug deep into their pockets, hit up their family members. Um, and were again lucky enough to get this publicly financed community development block grant to help with their initial capitalization. And that was, you know, touch and go, I think, for a while. Our wages are not as simple as saying we get paid, you know, we charge a certain amount per hour, we get paid that and we keep it moving. In our model, and this took a long time to go back and forth and negotiate with each other. We had um, people that would help us. We did a retreat dealing specifically with this. 
We had Green Worker Cooperative through its co-op academy provide support with this decision. And we had um, an attorney from the Urban Justice Center that does cooperative um, law, basically, help us through this as well. So it wasn't just as simple as, oh, a lot of people might think that it's like, oh, you get together and you develop your own stuff. We do, but we also ask for support from the different skilled community that's out there to support worker-owned cooperatives. Well, everybody here makes the same wage, so there's no, um, there's no hierarchy um, between members at all. Everybody makes the same wage and everybody's probably give, everyone's given the same amount of respect. So. At Union Cab, our pay disparity is 1 to 2.2. So from the very beginning phone answer to the business manager. Personally, I took a huge pay cut, but the benefits really outweighed the money. In the worker cooperative um, kind of scene, the term profit is not always used in the same way. Um, we Sometimes we think of it as surplus, like what is the surplus money after we paid of all of our, um, our electricity bills, our things we're selling, our, and even our wages. Um, so then we have, we have the surplus, what's left over. We div divvy up our profit at the end of the year, going through what we made as a, as a whole, and putting back in what it takes to run the business for the next year to come. And we find out how much profit we can play with, and, and we, divide it up to each employee in the cooperative. Our buy-in is $3,000, so we will take a paycheck deduction, um, and then once, once that is started, the worker owner will then get health care benefits as well as um, we do other things like uh, company paid cell phones and at the end of the year we will give out a bonus so to speak if the shop were to make money um, the profits that we make for the year will be divided equally uh, amongst the worker owners and the shop it's important for a startup co-op to be connected in networks of other co-ops because there is a ton of resources out there for people trying to get something like this started. Free resources um, that you don't have to pay for. The U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops has just compiled this amazing database of documents of other co-ops documents, process documents, startup documents. And if you live in a part of the world where there are other co-ops, um, I would, and you're wanting to start a co-op, just go hang out there, talk to the people, um, because really, just as an individual co-op enterprise can only be successful if there's good relationships among the members, the co-op movement as a whole can only really exist as a movement if the co-op businesses are engaged in these ever-expanding layers and levels of networks um, and cooperating with each other. Um, that brings a, a value that is not financial or even quantitative, um, but that is life-giving. It's, it's really the life of the co-op. I, I do feel that the small cooperative initiatives and small cooperatives have a really important place in our ecosystem. And actually, when they come together, they can kind of create something that's bigger than the sum of its parts as well. But I feel that the greatest need is for larger cooperatives within our ecosystems and for systems change. We really do want to in encourage businesses that are of scale, and scale can mean a lot of different things. So one of the most obvious ways is it's a business that employs a lot of people. So there are some examples like that, like Cooperative Home Care Associates has over 2,500 members, around 2,500 members, and that's a business of scale. There are other examples of scale which are businesses that are part of a network, um, and so the, a good example of that is the Ares Many Bakeries. They are a network of small businesses, but as a group, they are, employ a whole lot of people and create real job, like real economic opportunity for a, a large set of workers through a series of interconnected small businesses. Project Equity, the group that I'm currently co-founding, is collaborating with other stakeholders to develop a blueprint for increasing worker ownership in the Bay Area. And we're actually um, looking at multiple pathways. So we're doing a co-op academy to support small-scale cooperative startups and growing cooperatives, because we think with a little extra support, business coaching, legal advice, um, and for co-op developers, some education about how to do co-op development effectively, that those initiatives can be more effective. 
And then we're also looking at business opportunities for larger scale worker cooperatives. So, so Alice and my co-founder and I are going to be focused on developing cooperatives that can employ 50 to 100 or more people. So looking at scale very explicitly. And um, in the Bay Area Blueprint, we're also looking at opportunities for conversions of existing businesses into worker ownership. Within Puerto Rico, um, they actually have a, a cooperative development commission, and this is part of the governor's cabinet. There's a position, and they've partnered with the Department of Education, and they have a goal to have a student um, owned cooperative within every single school in Puerto Rico. If you read the legislation, it really gets into the idea of developing and an understanding of the cooperative model and how it can be used. And so when, when these students get into and start contributing to the economy, it'll be part of their foundation. It's not an alternative. It's part of what they believe in, what the economy can do for them, and, and using the cooperative model to achieve their goals and the community's goals. I'm somebody who does economic democracy. I'm somebody who does cooperatives, um, and I want to see cooperative development um, lift up communities throughout the Delaware Valley, throughout my region. We're a part of this bigger movement. We actually represent so much just by existing, just by showing people that it's possible, being successful, and being a living, breathing, working example of you know a better way to do things, to do business. I was in another form of a cooperative, but it wasn't my cooperative, and it was called sharecropping. I come from sharecroppers, and now I have my own company, and it feels so great. It feels so good. This documentary was made possible by the National Cooperative Bank, the Serdner Foundation, the Fund for Democratic Communities, and all the contributors to our crowdfunding campaigns. Find out more, we have how-to guides prepared. Go to either of these websites to learn more.